Well, here we are in week four, and you're doing a great job. I'm proud of you all who, who are coming through this and going through this with us. This is going to turn out to be something great for Faith Family Worship Center, and I believe it's gonna be great for you too, because we're discovering new things about ourselves that we've never known before. And these new opportunities are going to allow you to be able to make a difference in people's lives. So far, we've discovered that you're a leader. You influence people. If you influence people, you can lead them. And you can and should lead, lead people to Christ and to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. You've discovered how to do this. Remember, leading someone to Christ isn't a debate, it's a miracle. Then last week, we worked on you helping them discover their new identity. Now, in this, I, I only use two distinctions, either selfish or a selfless giver. They may have some other titles that they would like to attach to themselves, but quite honestly, just ignore them because never, you should never confuse what they are with who they are. And a lot of times, they want to talk about what they are, but they don't understand the who. Now, this week, we are going to get into love. I know, it, uh, it's uh, sometimes a sensitive subject for people. It could really trigger some people in ways that you didn't see coming. The abuse of love and the term thereof goes back as far back as Genesis. Cain killed Abel. That's not brotherly love. But today, because of child abuse, pedophilia, spousal abuse, emotional and physical, porn addictions, and more, love can trigger a variety of emotions. And when they hear the word, word love, it takes them back to somebody who said, I love you, and then they hurt them, and it brought pain into their lives. So when you start talking about love, they may misunderstand what you mean, and you may need to take some time to help them understand it. Um, remember, there are six levels of communication. There's what you said, what you meant to say, and what you really said, and there's what they heard, and what they thought they heard, and what they really heard, okay? So you need to take the time to listen and to get them to verbalize back to you what you said so that as you begin to go through this, this revelation of what real love is to them as, as, as God begins to unfold it in front of them will be something that they can understand, something that they want to embrace. Now, hell has gone out of its way to discredit and devalue love in every way possible. But it's not impossible for you to be able to restore it back to its proper place. You have the Word of God. You have the Holy Spirit. You, you, you have the full backing of heaven. You have this church. You can do this. Believe me. Now, make sure you understand love. That's the first key. If you don't understand it, you don't get it. It's hard to tell people about something that they really don't know anything about. So let's start with agape love. It's one of four Greek words used to describe love in the New Testament. And it's the love that Jesus shares with you. It's a self-sacrificing love that doesn't expect anything in return. That means that Jesus died on the cross because he loved you and he wanted you to have eternal life with him, but he did so with, with no understanding, or not no understanding, but he didn't know if you're going to accept him or reject him. So he just died for you anyway. Can you appreciate that? Can you wrap your head around that? Does that cause you to want to follow him with your whole life, all of it? Does it motivate you to worship Him? I mean heartfelt, broken worship. You just want to celebrate that love that He puts. You want to just open your life up and receive more of what He has. If you do, then you get it, okay? In order to understand the depth of His love, you have to understand the depth of His forgiveness. That's how He proves His love to us. Now, if you're talking to somebody uh, and you're talking to them about, uh, you know, they've, they've given their life to Christ and you're talking to them about all of this and they're not getting it, don't panic, okay? That first thing, don't, you know, I, I'm not getting through to this person. Don't panic. Ask them what they think love is. I doubt if you're going to get an answer like Jesus, you know, the self-sacrificing love. But help them understand that they're forgiven. And how do you do that? Well, first of all, understand, help them understand the depth of their sin. 
How much trouble were they in? Well, you were in enough trouble that you were doomed to burn in hell for all of eternity. But because you believe in Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God and you repented of your sins, he forgave you and his blood was shed upon the cross and he gave his life so that could happen. Now, as you go along here, you're gonna get an aha moment. It's a Holy Spirit thing whenever they go, aha. And you may even have to lead them in the sinner's prayer again because the realization of what has happened, whenever that sets in, it's going to cause them to experience God's grace and mercy. What do you do whenever that happens? Celebrate it. I mean, make a big deal about it. Whenever they, whenever they experience that freedom that comes from knowing that you've been set free from your sins for all of eternity, never to be called against you again, you're getting it. Now you're starting to understand what love is. Well, what about counterfeit love? There's plenty of it out there. Most people have experienced something that was labeled love, um, but it wasn't. Some, most of it, it's abusive. Sometimes you'll hear someone say to you that my parents said that they loved me and then they beat me. Or even worse, somebody might talk about a family friend or a, a, a family member who said I love you and then sexually abused them. Don't panic. That, the first thing you do, don't panic. This is way more common than you think. Okay, and um, the sheer terror on your face will frighten them. They're looking for a friend. And remember, we love heals, real love. So what you're doing is gonna help them discover healing in their life. First of all, don't be afraid to call for help. Call us, we're here. Um, but remember, you're part of the healing process. Don't be afraid to tell them that what happened to them was wrong. Don't be afraid to tell them that not everyone is that way. And especially tell them God would never fail you that way. Now, if it gets to the point where they need some kind of professional help, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. We'll do our best to find them the help they need. Now, it leads me to another Greek word called eros. Some say eros. It's sensual love. And it was created to be practiced in marriage. The Bible's clear about it. It's really not open to any new interpretations. Obviously, our society has abandoned this principle and as a result of that, really lost its way, um, and especially in the area of love. When Eros love is perverted, it devalues the people involved. Yeah, it's, I know it's kind of hard to understand that, but whenever it is practiced within marriage, it is an expression of love. Eros love was never intended to be a recreational sport. Now, that leads me to a problem of having love for something greater than a love for someone else. Now here, we could talk about people being addicted to sex, addicted to drugs, addicted to alcohol, or any of those things. And here, oftentimes, we hear the word abstinence, to abstain from. Now, um, we, we, we teach abstain from sex before marriage, abstain from recreational use of drugs or abuse thereof, abstain from drinking alcohol, smoking, and other things. And I recognize that maybe for some of you here, this may be something you're struggling with. I want you to know, just, just hang in here for just a second, that you know we'll get into what you can do next. The world would like for everyone to believe that the only reason why we say things like this is because we're trying to control or manipulate people and keep them from happiness. Um, that we're keeping some kind of secret from them that if <clears throat> they would just go ahead and do it, things would be great. Look at Genesis 3 where Satan tempts Eve. It's the exact same argument. Hmm. And you see how that turned out. So yeah, there are some things to abstain from. Now, the world would like to create all these gray areas. Well, it really isn't sex if, really? Um, you can smoke a little weed as long as you don't get high. Well, what's the point in smoking weed? Come on. Um, oh, it's okay to have a drink or two. Um, FYI, you're drunk after one drink. Um, abstaining from something is an act of love. I know, you probably haven't heard that before, but it's true. To abstain from sex before marriage is an act of love to one's 
the future of one's mate. Not getting addicted to drugs is an act of love that keeps your family from being hurt. Not drinking is an act of love that helps others who are struggling with this problem not to be tempted to fall off the wagon. I can go on with this all day long. Just things we don't do because we love. We love them. And what you do for people who want to give up something but they can't, well, they're in bondage. You got to understand that right off the bat. And there are plenty of ways to help them to find freedom from that bondage, depending upon the need and the seriousness of the need. And just ask, we will do what we can to find uh, all the help that we can for them. But what do you do for people who don't want to give up something? I mean, they, they want to be saved, you got that, but I've had plenty of those over the years. I can tell dozens of stories. First of all, you continue to love them. You don't reject them. They're a sinner who needs Jesus. You just have to remember that because they're still trying to figure all this out and they're still more in love with whatever they're in bondage to than they are with Jesus. But you gotta stay in their lives. Don't try to change them, it'll never happen. But do try to lead them to Jesus. That's their only hope. Now somebody's gonna start the whole, the whole sermon. Well, you, can't, you can lead a whole horse of water, but you can't make them drink. Yeah, you can, just gotta wait there long enough until they get thirsty. That's how you do it, all right? What about an imperfect love versus perfect love? We, we get this image in our mind that We've got, to, we've got to be these kind of loving people. And you know, we got, let me tell you, Jesus loves you and me with perfection because he's perfect. But we love each other with flaws because we live flawed lives. And that means that we make mistakes and that we hurt each other. And that's why you need to learn two words. You may need to write these down. I want you to remember these. So you might want to, might want to write these down. And, uh, and, and, and so that you understand the two words are, here we go, or I'm sorry. Okay, did you get that? I, I, I wanna make sure you got that. So say it with me now, I'm sorry. Okay, um, and you, you, do you, are you sure? You sure you got that? Did you, you, know, you don't need to write that, okay. Think about those words for a few moments. You've used them before and you've probably used it with family, close family, and dear friends. Why? Well, the Greek word for family love is storge. Jacob loved his sons. Mary and Martha loved their brother, Lazarus. And here's the reason I point that out. We are quick to repair what we have damaged when we value the other person more than ourselves. That goes back to abstinence, that goes back to everything else I was talking. So let me say it again. We are quick to repair what we have damaged when we value the other person more than ourselves. This is what you have to do with people who you are helping to grow in a relationship with Jesus. You've got to love them more than yourself. That's agape love in action. And now you understand Jesus' word, words in John 13, 35, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, I could talk about what you have to do here all day long, but here's an illustration I use to help leaders discover what they need to do. When you're working with someone who is new in faith and you're loving on them, and I know this, it seems like you're just pouring love down a black hole. It's like, there's a bottomless pit. But I guarantee you that you will one day fill it up. You just keep pouring, you just keep pouring and you just keep pouring. And I'm not talking about days or weeks or months, sometimes it takes years because that's how desperate they were whenever they entered your life. Think about that. You just keep pouring love into them. Believe me, it will finally do that. That leads me to the last word in the Greek New Testament is phileia, phileo, some use that, that one too. It's brotherly love where we get the word Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. This is the kind of love that brings unity. It means that someone is dear to you. They are prized, that's personal. It's a trusted confidant, a friend, someone who is held close and dear. And we as a church must love each other this way. 
I'll say that again. We as a church must love each other this way. You are, you know, connecting with each other, checking up on one another, calling each other whenever you're absent, and checking on other people whenever they're missing. This is because we value their friendship in our lives. They're, they're valuable to us. So, otherwise, if you don't do this, your new believer is going to think that a relationship with Jesus is an individual responsibility, and they will fail to see that it's something that we do together. Introduce them to people. Not just me. I mean, please introduce them to me, but introduce them to lots of other people. Let them all be able to be a part of their lives. Help them to get involved in different ministries within the church and different activities and events as much as possible, as soon as possible, online or, or in-house. And yes, this means you may have to participate in some things that you normally wouldn't be a part of, but once they start making new friends in the church, you'll know then that philea is taking place. And that's what you want to see happen. You want to see them build relationships with people in the church. All right, now it's Randy's turn. So love on him, okay? And uh, show him some love here in a little bit. And I will see you next time. We're going to have a great time together next week. God bless.